Zero. Sorry I was late. Um, and sorry I mean my biting clothes, that's because I was running late. Uh, and if it sounds like I can't talk very well, it is because I can't talk very well because I have my mouth is numb, having just come from the dentist's office. So <laughs> this was an unanticipated thing that was like, I booked in after I scheduled doing this talk. So, we'll do my best. so, um, so we're going to talk tonight about high altitude medicine, and the way we're going to kind of work through this is I've got kind of an interactive case-based approach that's going to help us hit on the key issues that you need to understand. For people who are traveling uh, up at high altitude or working at high altitude, which is becoming an increasingly prevalent thing uh, as well. So let's start with a very simple, oh, we're white on my screen, show that in my photo. Um, so uh, we'll just move on to the next slide. So at what altitude does the risk for altitude illness begin for a given uh, individual? So, see what you think. 6,000 feet, 8,000, 10,000, or 12,000. So, for the average person, above which of those altitudes do you have to get before you have to worry about the risk of altitude illness? Pick any form of poll. How many people think 6,000? How many want to go for 8,000 feet? How about 10, 12? I think the best answer here is actually about 8,000 feet in elevation. Once you get above this elevation and you stay there long enough, you're at risk for developing one of several forms of acute altitude illness, which we're going to talk about tonight. But highly susceptible people are actually at risk at lower elevation. So there's plenty of reports of people developing altitude illness lower than 8,000 feet. And people with underlying cardiopulmonary disease, sometimes the physiologic changes associated with acute hypoxemia get started at lower elevations around five, 6,000 feet, and those people might be at risk for a whole set of other problems besides the acute altitude illnesses. Now, in terms of where in the world someone might be traveling, where they can get up above these elevations and you need to take the altitude into account in terms of planning the trip and the risk for developing certain problems, any of the areas that you see here marked on this crude map of the world in black are regions where the mountains have large sections that are above 8,000 feet in elevation. So in the United States, you're really talking about the Sierra Nevada in California and the Rocky Mountains going all the way from New Mexico all the way up to the border with Canada. Scattered parts of the Alaska range are certainly high in there. In South America, the Andes Mountains going all the way from the northern part of the continent down to the southern part of the continent. In Europe, the Alps and the Pyrenees. Everyone knows about Kilimanjaro in Africa, but if you go to the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, they're high enough to cause problems. Scattered parts of the Middle East, in particular in Iran. And then the most noteworthy area of all are going to be the Himalaya in Nepal, Bhutan, Tibet, China, and uh, northern India. When people are traveling to these regions of the world, they need to be taking the altitude into account as they plan their itinerary and need to be prepared for problems that might develop on the course of their trip. Now, people often wonder, what about in Washington State? What's the risk of developing altitude illness? And although we have a lot of mountains, in the state between the Olympic Range and the Cascade Range, both the North Cascades and the Southern Cascades. There's only really a couple of areas where you can get into trouble, and that is up on the uh, volcanoes, most of which, actually all of which, get up above 8,000 feet in uh, elevation. But a lot of people who climb these mountains are not actually going to have any problems with acute altitude illness, despite the high elevation. And the reason is, there is an important interaction between the altitude you reach and the time you spend there. So the risk of getting sick at altitude is not simply a function of how high you get. It's a function of how high you get, how fast it takes you to get there, and how long you're spending. So, for example, you will read, if you pay attention to discussion boards on like Northwest Hikers, Cascade Climbers, Trans all year, how many of your trip reports of people who climb up to the top of Mount Rainier in a single day and ski down from the summit? And many of them get away with it, partly because they already know their personal tolerances of the altitude. But the thing is, although they ascend to a very high elevation very quickly, they get up to the summit, they hang out for about 15, 20 minutes, take some photos, strap on their skis, and immediately start skiing down and get back down below an elevation which they would get sick. Now, if you take that same individual, though, they climb up to the summit of Mount Rainier in a single day, and then decide they want to camp on the summit in the crater. Now they're going to be spending a way longer period of time at that very high elevation 
And now their risk for altitude illness is going to go up significantly in that setting. Okay? So this interaction between how high you get and the time you spend there is one of the reasons people can get away with very fast ascents. Okay? But the longer you can spend up at a higher elevation, the greater the risk. In general, though, what happens is people start to learn their personal tolerances. They know I can go high, this high, this fast in a single day, and other people are no way. If I go above a certain elevation in a single day, I start to get uh, sick. Okay. So with that in mind, let's look, start looking at a couple of uh, scenarios. And our first scenario is an individual who is uh, trekking to Mount Everest. And you're working as the medical provider on this uh, climbing expedition. And on the eighth day of the trek, you stop off at one of the villages about 16,000 feet in elevation. And one of the clients that's moving on the trek comes over to you and asks you to take a look at his friend because he's concerned about the way he is uh, breathing. Well, I'm going to skip out of my slideshow for a second because my PowerPoint does not like my movies at all these days. And so I'm going to show you the movie here. And pay attention to the way this individual is breathing. Okay. Does anyone want to see that again? Appreciate the key things. All right, so let's go back into the talk. Now the question is, the slide comes up. What do we do with this member of the truck? So, what are you going to tell this person who came up to you expressing concern about that individual? So, talk it over and see if this person is sick, not sick, need to go down, stay where they are. bunch of bigger breaths and then I got smaller and smaller and then he was apneic. And that's central sleep apnea or what's often called chain stokes respirations. So that's not that's not a normal breathing pattern, right? Um, so sick, not sick, does he need to go down? Well I'm worried because does, does he have a higher tolerance to carbon dioxide? And then if he and then like he reaches the threshold and then he starts like breathing it down then if he's going to high altitude, he's going to be exposed, you know, to higher and higher levels. I feel like that would be detrimental because he won't start, maybe he won't breathe as much as he should. Wait, but he, his problem is that he has a higher tolerance. 
Moving to altitude is gonna like raise its overall CO2, right? So when it helps. Oh, I mean, this CO2 is fluctuating significantly as he's yeah. doing this fight. When his apneic is starting to rise, when he's breathing, it's actually going down quite low. Getting more hypocrite because he's at the high altitude. I'm saying, like, wouldn't he have more drive because he was at altitude? Probably actually has a very strong drive, which is why his dental flow responses, the changes in PCO2 are so high. It turns out you guys are asking a lot of good questions trying to sort this out. So he does, in fact, have central sleep apnea, change those respirations. This is a highly common phenomenon in people who are otherwise doing fine at high altitude. It happens to lots of normal individuals at high altitude. So we told you in class that down here at sea level, you generally only see this in people with bad heart failure and following severe neurologic injury. At altitude, this happens in totally normal individuals. And it's one of the normal responses you'll see to high altitude in some. So it's important to understand that when people get up to high elevation, there are going to be certain characteristic physiologic responses to the low ambient partial pressure of oxygen as a result of its effect on the alveolar PO2 and the arterial PO2 and arterial oxygen content. So the low arterial PO2 is going to stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptors, raising your minute ventilation, that's the hypoxic ventilatory response. The low alveolar PO2 causes hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, so you get an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance and a rise in pulmonary artery pressure. EPO production goes up in the kidney and over a period of days to reach to make more red blood cells. And there's also increased sympathetic nervous system activity, so people end up being more tachycardic. In some cases, blood pressure rises a little bit, although not much. So there are important physiologic responses to alveolar hypoxia and arterial hypoxemia. And as a result, individuals manifest a whole range of different things, much of which they appreciate on their own. So for example, both at rest and with any level of activity, they're going to have a higher heart rate than they do at sea level. Many people may not necessarily appreciate that their minute ventilation is higher, but when they lay down in bed at night, they'll feel themselves like, oh boy, we're taking a lot of deep breaths. Or they'll appreciate that they're taking more frequent sighs uh, than they normal. They were very out of breath on exertion. And even if you're in great physical shape, you say, for example, you go climb Mount Sai here in our area and put a 20-pound pack on your back. Right? Take that same 20-pound pack, go up to 14,000 feet, and try to try, try to climb the same type of incline as on Mount Sai at the same pace. You'd be way more out of breath. But the key thing is, when you stop and rest, within just about 30 seconds to a minute, your breathing comes back down to normal. And people urinate a lot more frequently at altitude as well. Now, I think it's very important when people are traveling at altitude that they understand how they are going to feel different than they do at sea level, even if they're not getting sick. And the reason you want them to understand those things, if they know what these responses are and they know to expect them, then when they feel different up there, they won't start to freak out and over-amplify every symptom that they have, convinced that doom awaits them right around the next turn on the trail. You can kind of provide some reassurance to them, like, yeah, you can be out of breath with exercise. It's usually just fine, and it gets better. Okay? But there's an occasional person who doesn't appreciate these things. They start to feel different up there. They get all anxious about it, and they have a lot of trouble functioning and completing their track, et cetera, if you worry. Okay? All right. Now let's look at another scenario. All of my photos and all the transitions are getting cut out for some reason. I'm not really sure. So there's a lot of eye candy in this talk, and photos for some reason are dropping out because of PowerPoint. Um, all right, the second scenario is you're working at the Himalayan Rescue Association, which is a little clinic that is on the main trekking route to Everest Base Camp. You have a village known as Thurache, which is just about 14,000 feet in uh, elevation. And the HRA will staff these clinics, uh, one in the Everest region, one in Manang, and one in the Langtang region with two physicians during both the fall and the uh, spring trekking seasons. And the trucker comes in and says, you know, I've got a headache and I'm feeling kind of, just I feel kind of punky, I don't feel great. It's a bit of nausea, wasn't able to eat much of uh, dinner, but denies being out of breath. The check on her oxygen saturation is 87% for eating air, and her heart rate is 105 beats per minute. On exam, she's tired of hearing, her lungs sound clear, she's got a rapid heart rate, some trace lower extremity edema, and you ask her to do some heel toe walking uh, on a straight line in the room, and she does just uh, fine. So, with that in mind, come up with a plan for this person. 
and think about what she has, or if she is sick, and come up with a plan for how you're going to uh, manage this. So chat about that for a second. Altitude. Sick, sick. sick. Okay, we agree with that. Um, what does she have? <laughs> okay, she's got some form of altitude. And to tell you, there are three different types of acute altitude. <laughs> what do we think she has? She's got EMS. She's got EMS, which stands for acute mountain She probably has known as acute mountain sickness. <laughs> so, what do you tell her at this point? Does she have to go down? Does she? Be able to stay and she continue on track. What would you do? What's that? I don't know if she needs to stay or she needs to go down for a little bit and then come back. Okay. I'm not sure. Descend. Descend. Down a little bit and then come back. Because if she's wasting it, she needs to go down. Descend. 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 Okay, so King's question is reasonable. It's that do we actually have to have her go down? Can she just stay at the same elevation and hang out for a period of time? Um, let her body get used to the altitude, do what we call climbing that disturbance. Could you give her like a cetazolamid or something? Okay, so Joey's question is can I give her a cetazolamid? What does that usually do? So that would make her excrete more bicarbonate. Mm -hmm. So then her, you can think of this, like her pH would go up and then. She should breathe more, so like get more okay. so oxygen. A, yeah, it's a good idea. So cetazolamide is a, is a, it's a diuretic. It's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. You actually get a bicarbonate diuresis when your pH actually goes down. Right. So you get a metabolic acidosis in your ventilation and it goes up. So that would actually be a reasonable thing to consider as well. I actually think most of all the things that you were bringing up here, they're all reasonable options to consider in this individual who has acute numb symptoms. Okay. I'll take you through what I think is the most appropriate approach in her particular case. So acute mountain sickness is one of the three main forms of acute altitude illness. And that, when we say acute altitude illness, we mean the entities that can occur within just one to five days of getting up to a given elevation in that range above which people can get uh, sick. Of those three entities, acute mountain sickness is by far the most common. This is the one you're most likely to see if you are on a trek at high altitude with a group of individuals. The symptoms typically come on anywhere from about four to eight, six to ten hours after someone gets up to elevations of 8,000 feet and above. But recognize that while someone might get sick when they get above 8,000 feet, another person might not get sick until they get above 12,000 feet. So the elevations at which people develop symptoms vary a lot from person uh, to person. And what you're looking for in order to say that someone has acute mountain sickness is that they have a headache plus one or two other symptoms, such as the fact that they are persistently lightheaded or dizzy when they're standing up, okay? sick to their stomach, maybe uh, vomiting, no energy uh, at all. And if you look at a lot of older descriptions of, or case definitions for acute mountain sickness, they will all mention poor sleep as one of the diagnostic criteria. But this is being reevaluated, and the reason is it's been increasingly recognized that even people who are otherwise doing great at high altitude often sleep very poorly when they are up there. So it's not necessarily specific for acute mountain sickness. It happens in a lot of individuals. So I think in revisions of the diagnostic criteria, of course, you might actually get tossed out across 
What's the lassitude? Lassitude, just really tired and fatigued, no energy. Okay? Now, importantly, in order to say that someone has acute mountain sickness and not something more severe going on, they have to have a normal mental status and a normal neurologic exam. If they don't, something else is going on. And so the diagnosis of AMS in the end is solely based on the symptoms that this person is telling you. And other aspects of their story, like, yeah, we just came up to 10,000 feet in a single day. You know, they've been at that elevation of 10,000 feet for two weeks, and now they have these, these symptoms. Something else is probably going on. Okay. Now, there are a variety of medications that you can use to both prevent and treat acute mountain sickness. Okay? For prevention, the standard medication is acetazolamide, okay? or Dynamox, as it's called. It's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Its main role is that it causes a bicarbonate diuresis, which lowers your pH by causing metabolic acidosis, which raises your minute ventilation. It has other effects beyond that, but that's the primary thing that it's doing. An increased minute ventilation means you bring more oxygen down to the alveolar space, more oxygen to the bloodstream, and kind of calms down some of the adverse effects. And for people who are allergic to or intolerant of acetazolamide, dexamethasone, is a perfectly reasonable alternative. There are randomized controlled studies of both of these agents in the literature demonstrating that they are effective for prevention of altitude problems. Now, if you look online and you get onto various discussion boards where people love to spout off about their medical knowledge, even though they have zero medical training, <laughs> you will see plenty of people arguing about the benefits of tongues and vitamin E and use ginkgo and all these other things. And there's really no good evidence to show that those things work. People have actually done some studies about ginkgo, but it's a complicated literature, and I don't think it's effective, and I wouldn't rely on it at all. There is some interesting literature that's come out recently about ibuprofen being able to be used as a preventive agent, which I'll talk about in a uh, second. But by far, the most commonly used medication is acetazolamide. Okay? It's a prescription, so someone has to get it from their primary care provider or from a travel plan. And I've seen problems crop up when people try to get prescriptions of the medication ahead of the trip. They usually hear one or two things from their provider. The provider often says, you know, I don't want you taking this medication because it's going to mask your symptoms up there and you're not going to really know how you feel and how you're performing at altitude. So I don't want you to be on uh, the medicine. And that's wrong. Okay? If you're taking this medicine at high altitude and you feel good, your body is acclimatizing appropriately. It's not masking any symptoms at all. It's perfectly safe in that uh, regard. The other thing you'll hear people say is, hey, this is a diuretic, and you're going to pee more, and I don't want you taking it because I think you're going to get dehydrated when you're up there. And it's true. It is a diuretic. You are going to pee more. But it's not as powerful a diuretic as furosemide or bumetanide. So the risk for dehydration is less than it would be with those agents. But importantly, you can just drink more fluids to compensate for what you're urinating out. That drinking of fluids will not counteract the effect of the medications and how it's helping your body climate test. So I don't think that's a valid reason for not being on the medication as well. Now in terms of ibuprofen, another one of my graphics for some reason dropped out. I'm not sure what's going on today. Um, ibuprofen's gotten some recent attention uh, as being useful for the prevention of acute altitude illness. And the reason for that was a nice study that was done in uh, the Annals of Emergency Medicine a couple of years ago where they took individuals up to a research station at about 3,800 meters 12,500 feet in the White Mountains of California, rapidly, by car and then hiking. And they randomized the people. Some got ibuprofen, 600 milligrams, three times a day, and others got placebo. And they showed in this study that ibuprofen was effective at decreasing the incidence of acute mountain sickness when compared with placebo alone. Okay. Now, there were also, however, a couple of studies that came out of Nepal where they also looked at the role of ibuprofen, and they didn't have as clear results in those studies as the nice positive result that they showed in this particular uh, trial. And before I think people should start reaching for ibuprofen as their prophylactic agent of choice, rather than acetazolamide, I think they need to understand that right now there are no good studies comparing ibuprofen to acetazolamide, showing that ibuprofen is superior. Okay. The other thing is, I think if you're doing a short trip up to the summit of Mount Rainier in one to two days, taking a couple of days of high-dose ibuprofen is probably fine. 
If you're doing a two-week trek in the Himalayas, in Nepal, high doses of ibuprofen for that long period of time may not be safe. There's some evidence that at altitude, people start to develop some gastric erosions and maybe some subtle ulceration in their stomach. And I think high doses of ibuprofen for long periods of time might potentially exacerbate that and predispose to GI bleeding. It's a theoretical risk. No one studied it. And importantly, no one studied use of ibuprofen for a long period of time in high altitude. So I don't, I'm a little wary about its use until more data comes out. And overall, I think there's much more experience with people using cetazolamide than there is with ibuprofen. So I still think that's the um, way to go. Now, in terms of treatment, when someone has acute mountain sickness, the first and most important principle is stop ascending and don't go any higher in elevation. Get the person rehydrated, not because, oh, that's not right. Yes. So the reason why you want to get the person rehydrated is not because dehydration causes AMS. It's that bad dehydration causes symptoms that are pretty much similar to those of AMS. Headache, you're punky, no energy, maybe sick to your stomach. Have the person take some symptomatic treatment for their headache or nausea, like ibuprofen, aspirin, acetaminophen. And in most cases, that's all the person needs to do. Stop ascending, take something for the headache, wait overnight, and the symptoms typically get better. If symptoms are really bad, or they don't get better with those conservative measures, you can add on acetazolamide as treatment, or give someone dexamethasone. Both tend to be very effective. Dexamethasone is going to work faster and probably be more effective for treating active symptoms. And I'd say if the person doesn't respond to this treatment and waiting at that same elevation, that's when they need to go down to a lower elevation. Descend until the symptoms get better. Things get better, they're okay to try to come back up to higher elevation and complete uh, their turn. Okay? It's fine for people who have had AMS to continue higher on their track. The key thing is the symptoms need to have gone away before they start going higher again. You shouldn't continue ascending in the face of ongoing symptoms. Okay? Yeah. Questions about that before I go on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what would happen if they did keep ascending? Uh, so, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, their symptoms would worsen. Um, would they pass out? It depends. Depends on what happens, but the bottom line is think of a fire and think of gasoline and think of pouring gas on a fire. If you have active symptoms of AMS and you continue to ascend higher in elevation, it's likely going to get worse. So, yeah, you can massage that a little bit. You know, if you're going over some pass and you've got symptoms of AMS and you're 100 feet below the, uh, below the pass, and once you get on the other side of the pass, you're going to descend 2,000 feet, go over the pass. But if you're trying to climb Mount Rainier and you're rolling through the 11,000 foot camp and you've got active symptoms that are pretty bad, some is 3,000 feet higher than you are, that's not going to work. That person's going to have a lot of problems in that case. So. Are you kind of totally related to hypoxemia? That would be really pretty much just So you know, if you could solve that question, you could have some high profile papers in the world of acute mountain sickness. Uh, research only because no one really understands the true pathophysiology of acute mountain sickness at this point. It's thought that hypoxemia is triggering a whole series of downstream effects that lead to AMS, and there's multiple causal pathways that have been investigated and proposed, but no one's really put together a nice coherent explanation for why it is that people develop AMS. So, for some like anticipatory guidance for like how long they'd have to stop mm -hmm. and then be able to resume, you know, like how much time typically they take it over. Yeah, so Mark's question is how long do you have to wait uh, before they can resume their activities? And generally it's you wait until the symptoms get better. And in some cases someone's gonna, you know, you stop, you take some acetaminophen, and maybe six, eight hours later, once nighttime rolls around, they feel better, or they wake up in the morning, they're feeling better. But some people, the symptoms might actually persist for another day or two. And as long as they don't accelerate and get worse, they're okay to hang out there and try to treat it symptomatically. It's only if they get worse or they start having neurologic symptoms that it's time to go down. But after like two or three days of not getting better, it's probably time to, to head down to a lower elevation. Okay. Yeah. 
Can I clarify the cetazolin as a prophylactic? It's not one that you would give maybe during that week. So, yeah, so Mark's question is can you give a cetazolamide for treatment as well as prophylaxis? It can be used for both. So if someone wasn't on it for prophylaxis and developed active, active symptoms, it would be fine to give it to them for treatment purposes. Is there an, ever any scenario where you don't use DEX over cetazolamide, right? I think it's just preference, and my just from personal practice, I just find that dexamethasone seems to work faster and be more effective for alleviating symptoms for people when they're active. What to do is that uh, the cetazolamide to like start having an effect. Say that again. Like, when would you expect, like, if someone has symptoms, when would you expect them to start feeling better? So the question is, if someone has active symptoms, how long would it take before they start feeling better? And it, it's going to take longer than dexamethasone because the medicine takes about. I mean, it's a twice a day medicine usually, so I'd expect it's at least several hours before they might start feeling some benefit uh, from it. Dexamethasone is also not going to take effect immediately, but probably still has a faster onset than the Okay? Yeah. All right, let's move on to our next scenario in my photo. Managed to make it. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to consider three individuals who are having trouble breathing. And the reason why we're going to think about this is one of the other forms of acute altitude illness is what's known as high altitude pulmonary edema, or HAPE for short. This is way more serious than acute mountain sickness, much less common, but far more serious. So you have to be able to tease out when someone is developing high altitude pulmonary edema as opposed to having the normal dyspnea at altitude or having some other problems going on. So I'm going to describe to you three people that I've interacted with in the mountains. And for each of these cases, I want you to think about whether or not they might have had hate or something else going on. So the first one is a climber. She's on uh, Denali. And she's climbed Mount Rainier before. She's been up Kilimanjaro as well as uh, the volcanoes down in Mexico. And on her second night at 3,000 meters on Denali, which is just above 10,000 feet in elevation, she awakes with gurgling in her lungs. The following morning, her oxygen saturation is 86% at rest, 70% when she walks around him, and she's a little bit out of breath with activity. So she waits, hangs out in camp, the group isn't going anywhere. But the next day, when the group is trying to move up to the next camp at 14,000 feet, she can't keep up with the group at all. She turns around, goes back to camp, and now her oxygen saturation is 70% at rest. She's out of breath with the exertion, and she's coughing up some blood tinged uh, sputum. No fever whatsoever. So think about that scenario, just consider in the back of your mind, does this woman have high altitude pulmonary edema or not? We don't get a chest radiograph because of where we are in this particular case. Okay. Now our second climber is on the same mountain. He's 49, uh, and he's in roughly the same area of the mountain. What his group has done is they kind of went, they set up a camp, and on the way up there, they stashed a cache of supplies. And then what they're doing on this day is they're going back down to the cache of supplies and they're bringing them up to their camp. This is what very common practice on Denali is carrying so much uh, gear and it's way of lightening the loads. So on the way back from the cache to their camp at about 10,000 feet, he's having difficulty keeping up with the group. And he tells his guide, boy, my vision is really starting to narrow in uh, on me and I feel really tired. He's not coughing, he has no chest pain, he's not producing any sputum, but feels very out of breath with any activity. They don't do any pulse oximeter checks on him. Not clear if it's because they don't have a pulse oximeter and they just choose not to do it. And this guy gets worried about it and says, you know, um, we've got a guided group from our company that's going down the mountain and we're sending you out with this guided group. And so his trip is over. And the question is, did he have high altitude pulmonary edema at the time that he was being determined from okay. Think about that. And then the third climber is also on Denali. He's at the advanced base camp, which is above 14,000 feet in uh, elevation. They've been there for six days, combination of letting everyone acclimatize to the altitude and also waiting out some weather. And on the morning of the sixth day at camp, he notes some difficulty breathing while he's walking to the bathroom. And that day, the group is planning to move from 14,000 feet up to 17,000 feet. And on the trip up to what's called the head wall, which is a steep ascent that you do heading out of that camp, he can't, he's having a lot of trouble breathing. He can't keep up with his group uh, at all. 
And he's sent back down to the 14,000 foot camp, and the ranger patrol medic sees him, gets a pulse oximeter reading on him, and it's about 69% um, percent at this time. Okay. The question is, does he have high altitude uh, pulmonary uh, edema? So three different people with dyspnea on the same mountain at various altitudes, and the question is, do they have high altitude pulmonary edema? So let's try to let's talk them through. Case number one, the woman who was um, having trouble breathing and then a day later couldn't give up with the group, hypoxemic at rest, coughing up blood and tumor sputum, what do you think? That's about as classic a story as you'll get for high altitude pulmonary edema. Breathless, hypoxemic at rest, coughing up blood tumor sputum. How about the second person who was breathless, coming back from the cache, vision narrowing down, Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's unclear what this individual had. He might have had high altitude pulmonary edema. But a big mistake was made is that no one checked his oxygen saturation. Oxygen saturation is great because people who are developing hate are way more hypoxemic than people who do not have hate. And if you could check his saturation, if it was the same as all the other individuals in this group, may not have hate. But if it was markedly lower, you'd be concerned about that individual. It's entirely plausible that he was experiencing the normal breathlessness at altitude, particularly physical exertion, and also had just an element of anxiety. And maybe he was hyperventilating a bit, which is why he's describing the world narrowing in on him. Ross? Yeah, I was, was going to ask you more about the narrowing vision. It's like he could be hypoglycemic a little bit and like a bag could contribute to sort of passing out almost. You, uh, so Ross's question is, would you consider hypoglycemia or other things as, as responsible for his symptoms? Certainly possible in the right clinical circumstances. The average individual, though, who's not on insulin doesn't actually become hypoglycemic in these uh, situations. But it certainly could be that he was hyperventilating or something else was uh, going on. So I think with him it's actually unclear what was going on. Hard to say one way or the other. Very limited information came back with him when he came to be evaluating the clinic to figure out what was going on. What about the third person? There's some probabilities I hear. I think that's a pretty good one. What's, but it sounds like you got a little bit of reservation about this one. What's atypical about it? What about the timeline? Yeah, that's a good point. So I think it's possible. Okay, um, They've been there six days when his symptoms came on. And typically, high altitude pulmonary edema comes on between the first and fifth day at high elevation. Those cutoffs are not hard and fast. But it'd be atypical for someone staying at the same elevation who was doing well up until that point to all of a sudden manifest hate after that duration of time. Now, interestingly, we treated him as if he had hate because we had no other diagnostic things that we could do at that point besides check his pulse oximetry. He was sent down, he got off the mountain, went from the village of Talkeetna back to Anchorage, flew back to New York, and gets off the plane and has a little bit of calf pain. Those who sees his provider gets a CT pulmonary angiogram, and he was in fact found to have a pulmonary embolism. Okay. But it is unclear if the pulmonary embolism happened on the mountain or happened as a result of his immobility on his long trip back from Alaska to New York, nobody proved that on the mountain he had no symptoms that were otherwise characteristic of PE, like acute onset of chest pain, calf pain, or anything kind of like that. So high altitude pulmonary edema is a non-cardiogenic form of pulmonary edema, meaning left ventricular function is normal. The reason this develops is that people get this over-exuberant response in the pulmonary vasculature to alveolar hypoxia. They get this marked hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction which causes a huge rise in their PA pressures compared to individuals who don't get sick. And the pulmonary capillaries leak fluid under those very high pressures. Typically comes on anywhere from about two to five days after people have gotten up to elevations of 8,000 feet and above. So this is seen a lot at ski resorts in Colorado. Early on, people have much more marked dyspnea on exertion. Okay, so whereas they might have had no problems keeping up with their group earlier in the trip, now they're falling behind, they're needing more frequent rest breaks, it's taking them a long time to recover on the rest breaks than the normal individual who's breathing comes back down to normal within just about 30 seconds to a minute. And quite often they have 
uh, a dry cough, but not always. As it gets worse, the dyspnea is present with more simple activities like walking on flat ground, changing their clothing, going to the bathroom, and then, in the more severe cases, they're dyspnea at rest. And the cough can become productive of pink, frothy-looking sputum, that's red blood cells that are now in their sputum, having leaked into the alveolar space. And they're often profoundly cyanotic. If you had the opportunity to get a chest radiograph, diffuse bilateral opacity, although it's classically described as sometimes they're more prominent in the area of the right middle lobe. Why that is, it's not well worked out. But the x-ray often doesn't look that much different than other forms of pulmonary edema, except you're not going to see the cardiomegaly that you would see in a heart failure patient. Now, the reason why you want to get pulse oximetry is that if someone is developing hate, they are going to be far more hypoxemic than other people who do not have hate at that elevation. You can see data from a study that was done in the Italian Alps, just below 15,000 feet in elevation, looking at the arterial PO2 and the oxygen saturations of healthy individuals and those who have hate. So if someone's having dyspnea and you check their pulse oximetry values and they're no different than everyone else who's doing fine, you probably want to be thinking about something else that's going on. But if they're far lower than everyone else, that's going to raise your concern for hate or something else that can cause hypoxemia like pneumonia or pulmonary embolism, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. So when so being hypoxia causes it and then this actually causes the source of hypoxemia? Yeah, the, the low alveolar PO2 is what triggers the exuberant hy uh, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And then as they flood their alveoli with fluid, the alveolar PO2 is even lower, and it does exacerbate uh, the problem. It's the alveolar flooding. You know, initially, their alveolar PO2 may be no different than healthy people, but as they flood their alveoli with fluid, they're worsening their VQ matching at that point. The reason that they're constricting is because the low alveolar PO2. Okay. Okay. All right. So, you've got a patient who's high altitude pulmonary edema, they give them diuretics. Should you give them some furosemide if you have it in your back pocket? I see a lot of people shaking their heads, you know why? That's the key thing. They're not fluid overloaded, right? This is a non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It is a capillary leak phenomenon. And in many cases, these people, because of the climbing and the extravascular extravasation of the fluid, they're often intravascularly volume depleted, and diuretics will make that situation worse. So unlike the heart failure patient who we treat aggressively with diuretics, high altitude pulmonary edema patients we do not treat with uh, diuretic therapy. Okay? In some older descriptions of hate treatment that came out of India and the military in India, writing up in Kashmir, they often describe giving diuretics, but that's not part of standard protocols. And in general, the treatment approach varies based on where you are, and in particular, whether you can access the health facility or not. So, if you are in a ski resort in Colorado and you can get into the emergency room and bail, many cases, all they simply do is they put you on supplemental oxygen. And in some situations, we'll actually send you back to your lodge with supplemental oxygen alone. Because that will raise the alveolar PO2, break the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. As the PA pressures come down, the edema and therefore the symptoms and hypoxemia dissolve. They'll sometimes do some other things for people who don't respond. But if you're off in some remote area on a trek and someone's got high up on their idea, they need to get down. You need to go to a lower elevation. If the scent is not feasible, you've got to find some source of oxygen or get them into a portable hyperbaric chamber, which we'll talk about in a little while. And you would strongly consider adding nifedipine or a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. These are pulmonary vasodilators that will help bring down the PA pressures that are driving the edema formation, okay? Our next scenario, we've got a clumsy climber. So you're working as a medical person on a volunteer ranger patrol on Denali, and your team is making their own summit attempt, and you're going across this area known as the football field at about 19,000 feet in elevation. And there's a climber in another party who seems to be kind of having difficulty with walking. And they're already on hour 10 of their attempt to get to the summit in uh, Baton. And they made their summit attempt, so they're moving from 17,000 feet up to the 20,000 some odd foot summit 
only about 18 hours after they got up there from the 14,000 foot camp. And I'm going to skip out of this for a second and show you a video of what this person might have looked like. I don't have an actual video of this individual, but this is what he might have uh, looked like at the time. So just pay attention to the way this individual walks. This is actually an Everest climber. And these guys were concerned about him because he's got these, you see these two ropes that are attached to him. They're, they're doing what's called short rope him because they're concerned about how he's doing. He looks strong, right? So that's an important observation in this particular uh, case, okay? So let's go back to my slideshow here. So that's a very important observation. He looks like he is drunk because he is walking around, as did this person who was staggering around the football field on the knowledge. So this is a person who's sick and needs to get down. And while you're trying to mobilize things to get him down safely, you're going to be considering some medications to help treat him. Which of the medications you see there on the screen would you want to give him at this point in time, provided you had it in your kit? All right, so how many people want to give him acetazolamide? How about dexamethasone? Manitol? Hypertonic saline? I have no idea what hypertonic saline is. I mean, I do. But <laughs> <laughs> hey, remember, board test taking strategy. I don't know that answer. I've never seen it before. I'm probably not the one to go with. So, all right. So I think the best answer in this case is actually to give this individual a dexamethasone. Okay. What does he have? Cerebral. Yeah, this is high altitude cerebral edema or PACE for short. Descent is critical. And while you're waiting to do that dexamethasone to decrease the cerebral swelling. Now, when you get on the wards, if you're not there already, I know some people here are on the wards, you will see that in the neuro ICU and in the trauma ICU, you do use mannitol and hypertonic saline to manage increased intracranial pressure and cerebral edema in certain types of patients. They're not used in the field setting. And the reason is it's very hard to monitor for the things you need to monitor for when they're on these medications. Mannitol also is an osmotic diuretic and will cause volume loss and can worsen any hypotension that someone may have. Another reason why it would be challenging to feel uh, environment. So those don't get used. Dexamethasone is your medication of choice in this uh, situation. So high altitude cerebral edema is the third form of acute altitude illness. It is also like high altitude pulmonary edema, not common. But it's really dangerous if it's not recognized and treated appropriately. So you want to be able to spot this when it is uh, developing. It typically does not happen at lower elevations like 8, 9,000 feet. Usually you see this at elevations of 12, 13,000 feet and uh, above. And what it causes is signs of global neurologic dysfunction. The person's getting cerebral edema. They shouldn't have focal neurologic deficits. So the most common thing that's described is ataxia. Right? The person's kind of staggering around as they're walking, like that climber was in the video. And if you're suspicious, hey, I think this person might have haste, Get him to do a heel-toe walking test for you. Find a line on the ground or make one and ask them to walk on that line. If they can do it like I'm doing it now, they're either normal or they might just have acute mountain sickness. Someone with AMS should not have any neurologic manifestations. But if they are staggering as they're walking down the line and can't stay on the line, you've got to be very suspicious that they are, in fact, developing cerebral edema. The mental status is often abnormal, and this is important because unlike someone who has acute mountain sickness who will come up to you and say, hey, I think I've got AMS, my head's killing me, I'm sick to my stomach, this is just what I read about. The person who has high altitude cerebral edema may be altered to the point that they don't recognize that there's a problem. So that's why the other people in the group have to say, hey, this isn't normal, we've got to get this person some help. And as it gets more severe, they become somnolent and can even lapse into a coma if it's not recognized and treated. 
Now, you do need to keep in the back of your mind that there are a lot of things that can actually look like bad acute mountain sickness or high altitude cerebral anemia. So, really bad dehydration can be more bad headaches. If you have a patient who has diabetes and they're climbing and they're using insulin, if they're using their normal dose of insulin but they're not eating as much because appetite is commonly decreased at altitude, they could be hypoglycemic and they manifest neurologic symptoms. And there are also descriptions of people cooking in their tents in bad weather who develop carbon monoxide poisoning, which causes headaches and neurologic changes as well. So, if you have someone who has really high fevers, stiff neck, you got to be thinking maybe there's something else going on. If someone has focal neurologic signs, like a hemiparasis, it's not cerebral edema, you got to be concerned about something like a um, stroke. So when the presentation is atypical, you got to consider those other things. But in general, neurologic signs and symptoms when someone's just come up to high elevation within the past couple of days, you got to be thinking about that. In terms of treatment, Dexamethasone is the highest priority for these individuals. You can consider adding on acetazolamide, but what they really need is dexamethasone. And you give it any way you can get it in, whether it's oral, IV, or intramuscular. You also want to try to get that person down to a lower elevation. And you descend as far as you can and or until the symptoms uh, go away. And if the is not feasible, subnaloxone, where you want to get them into what's known as a portable hyperbaric chamber or a gamma bag, that's just the name of one of the brands of these things that are out there. It's worthwhile to take a second to describe exactly what this is. You do the gamma bags, you take the sick individual and you put them inside the, uh, the bag. And when they're in there, you zip up this tight sealing zipper here. There are some windows that you can use to communicate with the person. And if someone gets on this foot pump, and then pumps the bag up nice and tight. And you're essentially raising the pressure inside the bag. One pound per square inch, maybe 1.5 pounds per square inch. And as the barometric pressure goes up inside the bag, that simulates a descent in elevation. So here's how it works. So you see a friend of mine holding an altimeter watch at 14,000 feet outside the bag. Then we put them inside the bag and we inflated the bag to about one pound per square inch of pressure. And you can see that the altimeter watch inside the bag is now reading 10,700 feet in elevation. So for this person, you have affected a descent of over 3,000 feet in elevation by just putting them in the bag. If someone is really sick and you put them in there for long enough, you can help alleviate their symptoms. Granted, when you take them out of the bag, they're back up at high elevation. But you've probably bought yourself some time that now they can walk down under their own power, or now the helicopter has finally arrived, or the horse has arrived that can get them down. You're not going to take them out of the bag and boom, the symptoms are immediately back. You have bought yourself a window of time to try to deal with the problem. Liz. How often have you, have you used that? Oh, yeah. have you been in this situation? So the question is how often have I used it? And for actual treatment purposes, I have not used it, because I've always been in a setting where I had other resources at my disposal. I put people on the black plenty of times for demonstration purposes <laughs> to show how it works, but haven't done it for treatment purposes. But there are plenty of descriptions of being used. You have to like stop and change out the air inside. So it's Stephanie, right? Yeah. So Stephanie's question is do you have to stop and change the air inside? And the answer is no, because you have to continuously pump the bag every minute. And that's mean there's enough of a small leak out of the bag. That that's maintaining enough ventilation of the back so that the person does not become hypercarbic. Okay. Um, in practice, if someone were exhibiting symptoms, you would put them in the bag, and that obviously doesn't you know, solve the problem completely. But would you get them to a stable condition, and then if they need to descend further, would you take them out and hope that you could basically stabilize them for long enough to yeah. descend on their own? Yeah. Next question is, well, how basically could I put them in there long enough that they stabilize the condition and they can descend on their own? Exactly. I might put them in the bag at 8 o'clock at night and keep them in until the morning, and then in the morning they're like, yeah, I'm actually feeling better. And I'm like, great, now we're taking advantage of the fact that it's daylight, and down we go. Uh, do, uh, awesome. so, do, do people take turns just bumping all night long? <laughs> yeah. That's one person. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, so, this, this so the questions come up are what are the challenges with the bag? So the first is you need resources. You need someone to sit there and pump all night long. That's time consuming. Uh, when you pump the bag up to high enough pressure, a lot of people have uh, ear pain, which can be very limiting, and the limit how low you can actually drop them in elevation. It's not great if you're claustrophobic, and it's terrible if you're vomiting. 
<laughs> so there are some limitations to it, but it's a potentially life-saving uh, thing in other situations. And these bags are not very heavy at all. They pack up no bigger and heavier than a standard day pack that people are carrying. So for large expeditions, it's very feasible to bring these along. Let's look at others. A, someone who's complaining of problems with their vision. So you're down in South America in the Cordillera of Miwash. Um, any of you guys ever see the, read the book Touching the Void or see the movie Touching the Void? So this is the region of uh, South America where this is going on. And um, as part of the acclimatization protocol for climbing this very high peak, the team is doing a trek around the Miwash uh, range. And following a trip over a pretty high pass, a friend says, you know, I'm having, I, I got some problem with my vision all of a sudden. And what she says is, there's just a black spot in my vision. I, I don't have any pain. You look at the eye, there's no redness uh, at all. Right? Um, sclera look clear, but she can't see out of that one spot uh, in her eye. And it's, and it's only when she, like, she covers her eye, and that's when she has the problem. So it's basically only one eye that's affected. The center of her focus, or it's off to the side of the picture? It's, it's kind of off to the, the side a little bit. But she's got this big black spot in her vision. What do you do? What does she have, and what are you going to do? <laughs> you can probably come up with an appropriate plan even if you don't know exactly what's going on. Yeah. 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 So does anyone does anyone have any idea what this is? What she has? So does it have to do with pressure? Mm -hmm. That's to do with blood vessels. It has to do with blood vessels. <laughs> <laughs> so say you don't know what's going on. What's going to be the appropriate thing in this situation? Okay. There's a lot of weird stuff that happens at high altitude. If you go in the literature, you will find case reports of people with like transient global amnesia, or transient cortical blindness, or focal cranial nerve deficits. Um, There's just a lot of bizarre stuff. And it's always hard to prove whether it's due to the altitude or something else. But in the end, if you're in some remote environment and someone's got some symptoms you can't explain and you worry that, boy, oh, this could be serious, they need to go down and see if it resolves. And if it resolves with descent, it was probably related to the altitude in some way. Now, this individual actually happened to have something as well described at high altitude, but not as well known as the acute altitude analysis, and that she developed a high altitude retinal uh, hemorrhage. When you actually do systematic studies and look at the retina with retinal cameras in trackers at high altitude and climbers, it's actually a reasonably common problem that people have these hemorrhages. But the majority of them are asymptomatic because the hemorrhage does not happen within a sensitive area of the retina. It's usually out in the periphery. It's not in the macula, or it's not in the fovea of their retina, so they don't know. It's only when it's large and or unfortunately well-placed that the person develops a black spot uh, in their uh, vision. And in general, if this develops, it's a contraindication to further ascent on that trip. That person really needs to go down to lower elevation if it is uh, feasible. And as far as people can tell, and what's documented in the literature, it is fine for people to travel to high altitude again in the future. They're going to need to wait a sufficient degree of time for this to resolve, and really need to get the input from an ophthalmologist when they get back down. Okay. So this is described. There are some other eye problems that can occur at, at high altitude. Snow blindness or ultraviolet keratitis. If you do not have good eye protection, very high risk for this, particularly when traveling on snow-covered terrain when there's tons of reflected light. As you go up in elevation, the amount of UV light increases dramatically because there's less atmosphere blocking it out. Okay. 
People who use extended wear contact lenses, um, the overnight use of them, keeping them in, that has to be avoided because the cornea gets its blood uh, oxygen supply from diffusion from the environment. And the contact lens can prevent that. So it increases the risk of corneal ulcerations developing in these individuals. And then a lot of people these days have had uh, surgery to improve uh, problems with their vision. And there's a series of things that have been done over time. The most commonly used procedure these days is LASIK. But there are a lot of people in the past that had radial keratotomy or a procedure known as photo radial. I can't remember what PRK stands for. LASIK patients probably do fine at high elevations, but people have had radial keratotomy at extremes of elevation above about 20,000 feet may actually run into problems with bending in the, you know, in the lens that causes alterations in the vision. And I don't know if you ever read uh, John Krakauer's Into Thin Air, but the Dallas pathologist who got into trouble with his vision and was left for dead on the mountain, he had had radial keratotomy in the past and his vision went bad because uh, of that. So, okay. All right, in the last couple of minutes, there's some other quick questions that people uh, often ask about regarding travel at high altitude based on things they've either read, hearsay from friends, or things they've seen on discussion boards. The first one is, hey, I'm in great physical condition. I run, tri I compete in triathlons, I'm a marathon runner. I'm kind of protected against all this altitude and this, uh, stuff, aren't I? False, right? That is wrong. The great athlete is just as susceptible as the average couch potato. Okay. Now, I mentioned before, though, that physical work at high altitude is difficult. Okay? So the better shape you're in before the trip, the more you're going to you, the better you'll be able to tolerate the physical work of climbing hills at high altitude when you're breathless. But being in good shape will not protect you against AMS hate or haste. Those people still need to pay attention to the rules about safe ascent route, for example, whether or not to take prophylactic medications, etc. You might have heard, if you pay attention to any of the stuff in the climbing world, is I heard that Viagra or Sildenafil, the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, can improve exercise performance at high altitude. Should I be using this? So this question comes up amongst climbers, not in treatment. Your friends might ask you this. And it turns out the answer to this question is a little bit on the complicated side. The phosphodesterase inhibitors are pulmonary vasodilators. So like nifedipine can actually be used for the prevention and treatment of high altitude uh, pulmonary edema. But for exercise, it's complicated. The reason why this now gets some attention is several years ago, people did a study as part of efforts to figure out why is exercise limited at high altitude. So you guys remember in class we put Kim on the bike and we did a VO2 max test? Well, if I put Kim on a bike on the summit of Mount Rainier, she wouldn't achieve the same VO2 max as she does at sea level. And people have been trying to figure out why that is. And one of the hypotheses is that with the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, the increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, right heart function is impaired, which therefore impairs left heart function and therefore they can't generate adequate cardiac outputs. So in this particular study what they did is they had people do exercise tests at sea level, breathing hypoxic gas mixtures, and then at Everest Base Camp. And they did two tests in each location. One, they had a placebo before. And then the other situation they did, they used sildenafil before the exercise test. And you'll see that they actually achieved a higher power output okay, when they were taking sildenafil compared to when they were on placebo. And the idea is sildenafil lowered pulmonary artery pressure, so decreased right ventricular afterload, and improved RV function as a result of LV function uh, got better uh, as well. So this raised some interest in whether you could use this to perform exercise performance at high altitude. But in general, I don't think this should be part of your plan for preparing for your trek or your climb when you're going to high elevation. It's not been well studied enough, and people do get into some various shenanigans as a social. Why did they do better at Everest than Everest? Oh, I think the second question is why was performance better at Everest Base Camp than, uh, than at uh, sea level? Let me throw that question out at you. What do you think might be different between the two situations? Well, the same people. Same people. Okay. No. So they might have had more hypoxia at sea level than at Everest. You're on the right track. I think that they actually tried to, the degree of hypoxia at sea level 
was designed to mimic what they would experience in other space. There's a key difference. Okay. That's, that's, the that's, that's the key thing, they acclimatize. So here, it's acute exposure. Like, you just put on the hypoxic gas mixture, start exercising. Here, they've been trekking for 12, 13 days, and then they're hanging out at every space camp for a period of time. And with acclimatization, there have been some uh, adaptations. Okay. So, um, another question that comes up is, you'll hear people say, you know, if you want to prevent AMS, you got to drink tons of fluid. Don't let yourself get dehydrated, because that's going to be the key. Right? And that's also false. This has been studied. Dehydration does not cause AMS. What dehydration does is cause symptoms that are very similar to the nonspecific symptoms of acute mountain sickness. Okay? So you want to prevent dehydration so that you're not getting fooled into thinking you have AMS. That being said, you got to recognize it's really easy to get dehydrated at high altitude. Because in addition to the fact that you are performing physical activity in a lot of situations, the humidity is quite low at high altitude. And you have a lot of insensible losses, particularly through your respiratory tract, when you're hyperventilating, and you're urinating more at high elevation. So you want to counteract that, but it's not going to prevent altitude illness uh, itself. And then finally, a lot of people say, you know, I got this trip planned to Kilimanjaro, and I'm really worried about getting sick. So what do you think that, what if I go to Camp Muir at Rainier, like a week before I leave for um, Africa, is that, will that prevent altitude illness? You can't view our on Mount Rainier is about 10,000 feet in elevation. Or they say, how about I fly out to Colorado and go climb one of the 14ers there and then come back down. And, you know, if I do that a month beforehand, will that help me? So it's another one of those things that's kind of complicated in terms of how to answer this. Okay. So what this generally gets at is this issue of what are called pre-acclimatization strategies, you know, things that you can do ahead of your trip to try to decrease the risk of acute altitude. So what sometimes climbers will do if their goal is to get up to the top of this big peak is in the days and weeks ahead of the trip, they'll make a series of trips up to more moderate elevations and expose themselves to altitude, get some of the physiologic responses going, speed along some of the acclimatization, and then take advantage of that when they do this. And a version of this that people now do without ever leaving Seattle is there are these tents that you can purchase uh, called like Hypoxico and various other products that are out there on the market. And essentially what you do is you sleep in a hypoxic tent at night. It surrounds your bed. And you sleep in a hypoxic environment for eight hours during the evening, and it simulates kind of making a climb. And I don't know if any of you guys have uh, had a lecture from or two from Paul Pottinger yeah. as part of your education. Well, Paul climbed Mount Everest last year, and for several months ahead of his climb, he slept in one of these tents in his bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea what his spouse thought. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 so another thing that people will do is, if this is the goal, what they'll do is, in a period of time leading up to their main climb, go up to a more moderate elevation, stay there for a period of time, and then do the final ascent. And the idea is when they're here, their body's starting to acclimatize to the high altitude as well. So both these things are described. Okay? And the problem is there are studies of these types of strategies in the literature, but no one knows what the best approach is for doing these types of things ahead of a plan to climb or trek to decrease the risk of altitude illness. And in the end, the answer is these things can't hurt unless you physically hurt yourself on your trip up to Mount Rainier. But whether or not they benefit you depends on how high those early trips are to high elevation. Right? If you just go up Mount Side at 4,000 feet, no benefit. Right? Camp Near at 10,000 feet would yield some more benefit. How often are you doing it? If you just do one trip to Camp Muir, and it was a month before your planned trip of Kilimanjaro, no benefit. But if you're going to Camp Muir every other day for three weeks before you head off to Kilimanjaro, you're going to have some benefit in that situation. And it's also a question of how close it is to your planned trip. If you're going to go to Kilimanjaro and you do your high altitude travel a month earlier, probably not much benefit. But if you go to Colorado for two weeks and spend all this time hiking up the 14 years and stuff and then go back to Denver, fly out to Africa, do your trip, that proximity to the trek is probably going to have some benefit for you. 
So you can massage all these things. And then finally, you've probably seen and heard these things. If you watch the Seattle Seahawks, Marshawn Lynch was warming up with one of these things on his face. They're called altitude training masks, but they are as if they're tight-fitting masks, and you breathe in and out of this mouthpiece here, which is essentially a resistor, which increases the work of breathing. And they call them altitude training masks. And the purported benefit is that they're going to strengthen your diaphragm and expose you to hypoxia and therefore help you acclimatize and improve your exercise capacity. Sounds great. You can look at the website on the web that, that, that they have for this product, and they'll tell you that this Russian scientist has proven that they work. And I think the only thing they've been demonstrated to do is make exercise really miserable. <laughs> Who wants to exercise very hard, breathing in and out through a resistor? Okay. So these devices shouldn't really be used as preparation for any big activities. At all. Okay. So big take-home messages. When you're traveling at high altitude or if you're advising people that are going to be traveling there, Make sure that you can distinguish the normal responses to the high altitude to the symptoms and signs of acute altitude loss. You want to keep the differential diagnosis broad. Not every problem that someone develops is related to the altitude. It could be a manifestation of too much insulin, for example, in a patient with uh, diabetes. Having a pulse oximeter along is great if you're the medical person, because this is going to allow you to evaluate respiratory symptoms appropriately and determine who may have high altitude pulmonary edema or some other significant problem. And in the end, if someone's sick with bad AMS, high altitude cerebral edema, or high altitude pulmonary edema, or they've got stuff that you just can't figure out what's going on and you're not sure what to do about it, descent is your best option in those situations. That's it. So, again, I apologize for being late. I apologize for some of the technical snafus that can hang around and take some questions. You guys come. Oh, yeah. What's um, so for the, the Viagra yeah. medication, mm -hmm. isn't it just, what about any other medication that increases like nitrogen and no, like is that, is that the reason why so, they, they suspect that? Melissa's question is, is anything that increases nitric oxide production, would that be a benefit? Yeah, I mean essentially what you're, what you're taking advantage of with sildenafil in that case. Yeah. And Tadalafil would be the same thing, is the pulmonary vasodilatory properties. So a calcium channel blocker like bilpiazin would conceivably have the same benefit for you in that case. Nifedipine would theoretically be the same thing as well. They were just looking for some medication to bring down HPV and lower pulmonary artery pressures. And why they chose the phosphodesterase inhibitors as opposed to the calcium channel blocker, I'm not sure. Is there a possibility of some off target like cardiac effects of the calcium channel blocker? You wouldn't want to reduce your heart output. I don't think so because nifedipine is used as prevention for pain in people who are known to be susceptible to it, and it's also used as treatment. So I don't think it's necessarily related to that. But I, I'd have to go back and look at the paper and see if they specified a rationale for why they chose it. So, Nick, is there a possible practicality to? Like EPO and blood doping as possible emergency measure, or even just performance enhancers. So, next question is: Could you use EPO for um, uh, dealing with problems at altitude? So, when EPO levels rise within the first 12 to 48 hours at high elevation, it still takes days to weeks for you to actually produce red blood cells. So, the benefit hemoglobin and hematic concentration and hematic would actually go up pretty quickly at high altitude. But it's not related to the EPO increase. The initial rise that you see is due to some volume contraction due to decreased plasma volume that occurs when people get up to high elevation. So the effects of EPO take a while to, uh, to come on. Um, so I, and I, I haven't seen anyone looking at using EPO prior to a trip to raise red blood cell concentrations. There's no doubt it plays a huge role in your long-term acclimatization. Uh, there was a really nice study done many years ago where they looked at these, these people were doing a study in Nepal and they were hanging out at like 19,000 feet for several months and they calculated, they drew blood and then calculated their arterial oxygen content breathing a hypoxic gas mixture equivalent to where they were going to be and the content was really low and then after three months at this elevation and the rise in their hemoglobin concentrations, their Actually, no, I got it backwards. So they, they knew what their content was at sea level. The content upon initial arrival was low. And then after three months, the rise in hemoglobin concentration 
brought their arterial oxygen content back up to essentially what it was at sea level, despite the fact that the PM2 was lower. So there are benefits that you get long term. Now it's interesting, if you ever spend enough time at altitude and your hematocrit goes up, when you come back down, exercise will feel great for the first <laughs> couple of days. You know, and it's, it's, you definitely see a benefit from it. And when you experience that, you'll say in the back of your mind, it's no wonder that a lot of high-level athletes have blood doped in the past because they're looking for that type of advantage. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.